just wanted to say that we miss you and we hope that you're doing well and we also just wanted to let you know that this would have been our last day of Sunday school where we would have been having parties and celebrations but instead we're not together so um, we thought that we would put together a little video for you so that way we could just remember how much we miss each other and we just wanted to say thank you to the Sunday school teachers and everybody that's been praying for us bye I miss playing with my friends and hanging out with my friends. I miss seeing my friends and singing with them. One, well, one thing I miss about church is our teachers. Um, one, I, but the best part of my week was with them. Uh, I also miss certain rooms in the chapel. They made me feel really good. I miss running in the gym with my friends after Sunday school. Max. My teacher was um, hearing about God and when when um, when I get to be with Mama in my Sunday school class. I miss seeing my teachers and learning with them. Most about Sunday school is my teachers teaching the Bible lesson. I miss the sheep. Who? The sheep. You miss <laughs> like your friends? Yeah. Okay. What I miss about Valley is the fun time he has in Awana. Um, what I miss about um, Sunday school is just like talking to friends and family and like um, I also, the mostly thing I miss is Audrey because like she's a really good friend of mine and I really miss her a lot. I miss most about Sunday school is running in the gym. Learning and playing. I like, I like the gym in school, in the high school. I like when we play. And I like, I like doing new things in the class. You do. Me too. And I got some hiccups. I miss learning about Jesus and God with my friends. Mm -hmm. I miss my teachers, Miss Luna and Miss Amanda and Kayla and Josiah and Micah. The end. Thank you. 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 Well, good morning. Welcome to Valley Bible Chapel. So glad you're able to listen in and and join us today on this broadcast. Hey, uh, Larry and, uh, and Charlie and Kaylin, thanks for those pictures counting us in. And Sunday schoolers, 
boy, that was great. And we miss you and uh, can't wait to, to see you guys again. That was a, a, a bright spot for me and I trust for the other folks as well. Uh, a, a bright spot probably because this week has been another week of difficult days, troubling news items, and we all are feeling this. And some in our community are really hurting. And we need help. We need strength. I'm reminded of a passage in 1 Samuel where uh, King David, he was being pressed in on uh, in all directions. And he was feeling the burden of leading a people. And the passage says that David strengthened himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. Uh, with that thought, why don't, wherever you are, um, please join me. Why don't we look to the Lord and pray? And Lord, uh, now for a moment, we want to be still and know that you are God. You are a refuge and strength in this present day of trouble. You're a, a fortress and a tower of strength. You are our rescue. You are a loving father. Everything we need is found in you. Heavenly Father, today I pray that you would increase our trust in you so that like King David, we would find strength in you. You're a Heavenly Father, you are a God of peace. Please bring peace and health and hope to our hurting community. Help our our friends and our neighbors and those around us who have great needs. Lord, we look to you because you are able. Thank you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So by way of announcements, I don't have too many. You saw all of the uh, scrolling announcements before this started. Just tune into those. If you see anything there that uh, you need information on. I will say there's a lot of great pictures that came in this week of Valley Bible Chapel really stepping in where there's a big need, and that's with Star of Hope and, and the food distribution. There is so much food coming in and so much food that is needed in and around our communities, especially there in Patterson. So if that's something you'd like to be a part of, there is room for you. Uh, please see Mary Beth, and, and she'll get you plugged in uh, it's a great work that's going on, and we want to continue to be a part of that. Um, tonight at 6 o'clock, our evening Bible study is on, uh, so you can tune in for that. Bob will be um, uh, at the helm for, for that Bible study, and we look forward to hearing from Bob here in a few minutes uh, for the ongoing uh, series we have in Matthew, and look forward to that. Uh, so now, uh, lastly, I'm going to move over to my computer there and take you through a new um, email format uh, virtual weekly bulletin that we're working on. I realize now you get a lot of emails from me, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. We're trying to simplify so that all communication, as much as possible, all communication comes through in one shot and you will get that on on Saturday night. So I'm just going to take a few minutes now and go over a few of those uh, moving pieces there on that email. Okay, you're in my email, and I just wanted to take two minutes and explain this new bulletin. The first thing you can see is that it's coming from us. This is Valley Bible Chapel. It is not junk or spam, uh, but coming from one of the elders. And your email there is protected. Uh, we're using an email service that will not send away your email address. It is private and protected and, and confidential. 
first thing you should do when going into your into your email uh, service in the case of Gmail I just want to let my email know that I am friendly so I'm adding Valley Bible Chapel as a contact and that way you can just be assured that it doesn't go to junk or to the social or promotional tab add Valley Bible as a friend contact and then very simply, and many of you have seen this already, it's like any other news item, news bulletin, or newsletter that you would get. All of the week's details are given here. So starting with Sunday morning, you would get the link to the site there. I'll actually just click it so that we can be sure that it takes us to our YouTube channel. It does. Uh, and then it, everything is self-explanatory. Uh, there's uh, the children's lesson and you can be aware there of what's going on uh, the zoom meetings are all captured here so there are prayer meetings through the week and this will take you directly in to that zoom meeting uh, the link is active uh, and prayer requests are here too uh, you won't be getting a, an additional email but this will be the place where prayer requests come in and it's great to be praying for one another if you would like prayer you can uh, click this and that will let you correspond with Debbie Spinelli about getting on to this prayer list. And then lastly, as part of the bulletin, uh, 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 information on how to give your tithes and offerings over, that will take you to the place you need to go. So this is uh, the early stages. We, we hope that it's a helpful tool. This will come through on your desktop email as well as your mobile phone and be easily hopefully easy to manage and um, get the important information you need as always let me know if you have any issues thanks
morning um, <clears throat> and Benny thank you for that thank you for that song and I think we have um, another song after the breaking of bread uh, that we can look forward to for I think both Benny and Cheryl so that's great so anyway um, just thank us again Benny for that well uh, we've already been welcomed but glad that glad that you're here I'm glad I'm able to be here in the in the auditorium we're looking forward to actually having some bodies in here with us one of these days. We'll keep you posted on, on how things are going to roll out there. But before we start the message, I would... Amanda sent me the Sunday School, just kind of a little teaser for the Sunday School lesson for this week for you guys. I know this, I think officially this was our last week of official Sunday School. But... Um, who knows what's going to keep happening. But the lesson for this week is the lesson about Jesus and the Samaritan woman. 
And man, that's a, that, that's a great, great passage. You guys get to, get to enjoy that. Here's this woman who probably had made a lot of really bad life choices, and a woman who was, she probably didn't have a lot of friends. Um, and the friends she did have were, oh, they probably weren't the right kind of friends. But the cool part, as you're going to learn in the, in the lesson, is that she has this amazing encounter with the Lord Jesus at a well. And um, yeah, anyway, you guys have a, have a great lesson ahead of you for this week. So I, I hope you really enjoy it. But <clears throat> I would like for all the rest of us now to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be looking primarily at verses 13 through 17. That's the, the passage of Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. You know, um, we're going to see in this section that God presents his promise to the world. He presents this promise, but he does it in order to establish the promise, who is Jesus Christ, as as God's preeminent one. It's almost like the Lord God the Father is saying, this promise is worth the wait. Last week we saw that um, God protects his promise. And this week we're going to see that he presents his promise. Last week we saw that he, he protects his promise despite danger, despite wickedness, and despite limited social stature. His promise remained sure. Even in the face of danger and wickedness, and, and even coming from a place of very little stature socially. You know, his promise, as Nick said last week, doesn't require the best and the brightest to carry it forward. His, his promise going forward relies totally on the character of God and on the strength and the sovereignty and the resolve of God the Father. And this week, we're going to see that God the Father presents this promise to the whole world. He unveils that promise with insight into his son's past. He unveils this promise with a revelation of his son's purpose in coming. And in this presentation, he declares the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Now, there's some comments on narrative theology that Vic has made some of these comments, as has Nick in the last week, last couple of weeks. So I want to pick up on some of the things that they've said, because this is narrative theology. This is narrative literature. It's the Gospels and the Book of Acts are narrative theology. The epistles are what um, some folks refer to as didactic theology, meaning teaching. And then the only other kind of literature in the New Testament would be apocalyptic, and that would be John's revelation at the end of the, at the, end of the New Testament. Um, narrative theology, the four Gospels in the book of Acts, some of the things to point out is we've already said that in narrative theology, um, dialogue is very important. As the narrator describes the events going on every once in a while that that narrator will quote a person as to what they say. So those quotes kind of make the, the students sit up and take notice now. So that's very important dialogue. Uh, grammar is not as important in narrative theology as it is in didactic theology. I love grammar. It goes with my personality, I guess. But um, grammar, we find every word is important, obviously, in the Bible. But in narrative theology, grammar is not typically quite as important as it is in didactic. Uh, word choices are very, very important. In didactic literature, 
oftentimes the writer, be it Paul or Peter or John, in, in the didactic groups, oftentimes they will actually not only use the term but explain it a little bit. In narrative theology, we, we need to, sometimes we need to really take note of the word choices. Uh, usage of the words, that, that, that's important in all of theology in the Bible, but word usage is very important in terms of the, the meaning of these terms in, first of all, the, the narrative's participants. If Matthew records Jesus saying something, it's important to know what Jesus was saying to the people to whom he was speaking. So that's almost the first level. Um, so word usage is important in the particip for the participants in the narrative, but it's also important when you consider the, the original writer. In our case, it's Matthew. Matthew writing to, I think, predominantly Jewish believers. Now, now, why is that? How is he using that word that Jesus said to, to somebody? How, how is he using that for his readers? How's Matthew? He, he's recording what Jesus said, and he is recording it accurately. But with his placement of that piece in the narrative, what is he saying to his original readers? And then, of course, we come to two, the year 2020, and we say, now, what is, what is the Holy Spirit? How is he using that word for today's readers? Now, it's not going to be different than how Matthew used it for his readers. But we need to grasp that. So word usage is very important in narrative theology. Another thing that's important as we go into Matthew, as we've already mentioned, Nick said this a couple of times, and so did Vic, the date of writing is really important. When did Matthew pen these words? You see, the events in the Gospel of Matthew, the actual events that Matthew is telling us about, those events took place almost entirely while Jesus was on the earth. There were some things that took place before the birth of Jesus in the early narratives here in Matthew, and then maybe a few things, minimal, following his resurrection and then following his ascension. But Matthew wrote these things down probably in the 60s. It's not the 1960s. As some of you who are listening would say, yeah, you know, the 60s, that was the best 50 years of my life. Um, no, this was the 60s, 60 AD, somewhere in there. Now note that that was 30 years after our Lord was crucified and rose again. That's really important. I'm going to give you a list of New Testament books that were probably written before Matthew. The book of James was probably 45 to 50 AD. Galatians was written either, depending on your view of Galatians, either in 49 AD or in 55 AD. Still well before Matthew. Mark was written probably in the 50s. First and Second Thessalonians was written in 51. 1 Corinthians was written in 56, 2 Corinthians 57, the book of Romans, the, the, the apex of salvation by grace theology was, was written in 58, which was two or more years before the Gospel of Matthew was written. Uh, the remaining books in the New Testament were written about the same time as Matthew, with the exception of some that were written much later. Jude was written somewhere between 70 and 80 AD. The Gospel of John between probably 85 and 90 AD. The, the Epistles of John, 90, and the, the book of Revelation somewhere in the early 90s. 
What's my point? That Matthew was written solidly into the era or the dispensation of the church age. And that's the same era we are in right now. So while the events preceded the day of Pentecost and the coming of the church age, the writing of the events, Matthew's writing, was solidly in the church age. And as I said, even later than some of the epistles that we read regularly. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 3, if you, if you would turn there, and pick up on some statements surrounding Jesus' baptism. Last week, Nick pointed out three Old Testament quotes, and he formed his sermon, and correctly so, around those three Old Testament quotes. They were quotes that were the structural markers in the passage. And, and this passage today, verses starting in verse 13, um, this passage does the same thing. It's structured around three statements that the participants in the narrative make. Um, John the baptizer here, John the Baptist, is the first to speak in this narrative. And with Matthew recording John's question that he asks to Jesus, we see, first of all, that the basis of God's promise is Jesus Christ. The basis of the promise that God the Father is revealing in this baptism narrative, the basis is the pre-incarnate life of the Lord Jesus. Verses 13 and 14. John's question here gives us insight, uh, gives us insight into the, um, the promises past. And we break in this morning at, at a section that runs from chapter 3, verse 1, all the way up through chapter 7 and verse 29. And in this greater section, we see some of the foundations of the kingdom that God is building with his promised son's arrival. Uh, but before we get to looking at Jesus' baptism, we need to look at, at this character whose name is John, all the Gospels talk about John and about him baptizing the Lord Jesus. And each of the, the, the Gospels give us some really interesting insight into, into John's description. He, he preached in the wilderness of Judea. Um, must have been a character. Um, the content of his message was all about God's people repenting and, and moving back to living under the covenant of the book of Deuteronomy. And they should be quick in this repentance, he says, because the fulfillment of God's promise is, is, is almost here. That's what he was preaching. It was indeed at hand, verse 2. Uh, this is chapter 3, verse 2. John took on the character, we see, and, and the mannerisms, even the actions of the great prophet Elijah. <laughs> and it, I find it interesting that while John was born into a priestly family, remember, his dad was a priest. He was ministering before the Lord. Uh, Zacharias was when 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 God appeared to him and, and told him he was going to have a son, and if you remember the account, he said, I'm too old, my wife is too old. And God said, you'll see. And just so you can see it even more carefully, he's, he wasn't going to let him speak. He took away his ability to talk. And then Elizabeth did become pregnant. And man, that was a, a great account. You remember it well. And... Uh, and with the birth of John the Baptist, that's when they asked what his name was going to be. And John could speak again. Excuse me, Zacharias could speak again. And he said, his name's going to be John. 
They said, why would you do that? They said to Elizabeth, actually, there's no Johns in your family. And then her husband spoke and said, his name will be John. But John ignored the priesthood as a profession. He would have been a priest. And he made himself into the near personification of this famous prophet Elijah. Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3 to identify John with the voice crying out in the wilderness, verse 3. And John looked very much the, the part of this kind of strange prophet in verse 4. A lot of the population of the day in Israel flocked to, to John for baptism. They showed repentance of their sins, verses 5 and 6. But, but John's address to the religious leaders was a sharp denunciation and a promise of their judgment in verses 7 through 10. Hmm. John also told of this soon appearing judge who was about to commence with the deserved judgment of Israel's hypocrites. The, the blade is already at the foot of the tree, he said. It's already taken that first marking swing for any of you who have ever used an ax. The, the first cut was there. And there's more coming to take that tree down. Then it was going to be thrown in the fire. That's John the Baptist. Wow. That's the guy who's dressed funny and he has long hair. He eats locusts and wild honey. And he's baptizing. And people are coming to him. Crowds are coming to him. And many out of those crowds are coming into the water, repenting of their sins, and saying, we want to get right with God, John. That's who Jesus comes to. And this is the man who greets Jesus in verse 13 of Matthew 3. And as I said earlier, we need to take careful note of the words that John speaks here. And Jesus came, verse 13, from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, <clears throat> I need to be baptized by you. And are, are you coming to me? You see, John knew about Jesus. He... He knew about Jesus, I'm sure, from the scriptures. He's, he's had about 30 years, just like Jesus, to put this stuff together. And he was a person of God's word. He knew that the Messiah was coming and that he would, upon his arrival, he would be judging sin. Wow. But a lot of prophecies from the Old Testament um, mingled the first coming of Jesus with the second coming of Jesus. We know in hindsight with the, the blessing of New Testament theology, uh, giving light to Old Testament theology, we knew that that first coming of Jesus was when he would come to pay for sins. But that second coming of Jesus is when he's going to come to, to judge. And John puts these two together. He says in verse 10, Even now the axe is laying at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. That was this, probably like these bamboo rakes that some of us may have at home now, but different, but they were wide, they were fans. And I don't know what they had for a handle, but they would take the grain that would be piled on the threshing floor 
and they would lift it up like a shovel full and they would throw that up in the air. And the, uh, on a windy night, that's why like you read in the book of Ruth about, uh, uh, about Boaz being winnowing on the winnowing floor at night. The breezes would come up apparently and, and it would blow the chaff away. He says this judge already has the winnowing fan in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John knew about Jesus from the scriptures. Second, he knew about Jesus probably from his personal history. Did John hang out with Jesus? I don't know. He was related to Jesus, we know, because when Mary had the announcement that she was going to give birth to Jesus, and there was that whole pregnancy before marriage thing and the Joseph, the Joseph deal where he was going to divorce her, which is what um, engaged couples had to do in the Jewish economy at the time, and he wrestled with that. He wanted to do it quietly because he didn't want to shame her. And then uh, an angel appeared to, to Joseph and said, go ahead and take Mary as your wife, for that which is in her is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Wow. Remember, she went to visit her relative. I don't know if it was a cousin or an aunt or whatever, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was pregnant with John at the time, and um, Elizabeth said, when I saw you speaking to Mary, the baby in her womb leapt for joy. <laughs> John probably heard that story too many times growing up. Can you imagine every time his mother introduce John to some, oh, before he was even born, he was brilliant. Um, yeah. I don't know if they hung out. From different areas, Jesus was up in Nazareth. John was probably down in Jerusalem. Oh, yeah, I guess the Jews would have set up in Jerusalem. Um, I don't know. They may have, if people were had a six day work week at least, and the seventh day travel was severely restricted. I don't think they took vacations like we do today. So they may have had very limited time together, these, these relatives growing up. They were pretty much the same age. Um, but he knew him. I'm sure he heard the story. I'm sure the moms, Elizabeth and Mary, compared notes as to how these kids were growing up. They also knew Jesus from personal observation. Um, you see, John would have had his ear to the ground in terms of the progress of religious events in Israel. From what mom had told him, I'm sure she said that this was the coming Messiah. And John made close observation of him and who he was. To the point that in the Gospel of John, the, the Gospel writer John quotes John the Baptist as saying when we saw Jesus coming, he says, Behold! He who takes away the sin of the world. John knew about Jesus. Second, John knew that his own preaching and his baptizing, they were not at all applicable to Jesus. That's why he said, you're coming for me to baptize you? No, no, you should baptize me. No, his preaching was not applicable to Jesus. And in some respects, his baptism was not applicable to Jesus in terms of a baptism of repentance. That's, that's why he was baptizing people, that, so they could demonstrate their repentant heart. Now, this is not New Testament baptism, people. This is not water baptism. 
John probably didn't touch the people he was baptized. They went and stood by him, and they themselves would have immersed themselves and come up, demonstrating a cleanliness from their, their renunciation of their sin, their repentance. So that's not New Testament baptism as we practice it today. A lot of people did a lot of baptizing in that time for different causes, for different identifications. But when Jesus came up to be baptized, John knew that this was not a baptism of repentance. The writer that some of us who are preaching here are reading, along with other ones, and many of you who are doing the small group studies in Matthew, that writer says here, um, John looked into the face of this one, being Jesus, who now came to him, and he could see a difference. He had been looking into the faces of those filled with guilt and remorse and sadness, but this one had none of that. This was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. This was the one coming who was greater than he whose shoe latches he was unworthy to even loose. There was no place for John's baptism in the life of Jesus, this author says. And so John countered that he should be baptized by Jesus. See, John's questions give us insight into the promises past, gives us insight. So the basis of the promise is Jesus Christ. Second, the purpose of the promise is, is also Jesus Christ. Looking at verse 15, this is Jesus' answer, the second person in the narrative to speak. And, and he brings insight into his purpose in coming. But Jesus answered, verse 15, and he said to him, permit it to be so. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he, John, allowed him. <laughs> Jesus' baptism, first of all, identified Jesus with the believing remnant, that remnant that we've been talking a lot about in, um, in the book of Isaiah. We just finished a while ago. The remnant, the believers among the nation of Israel, the faithful believers. And Jesus identifies with them. They were coming for baptism, so would he. His baptism not only identified him with the believing remnant, his baptism authenticated John's ministry. Jesus himself, by coming to be baptized, is authenticating who John is. That John is that voice prophesied in Isaiah of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare for the coming of the Lord. Look what he says here. Jesus says, it is fitting for us, for you and I, John, for you and me. This is how the forerunner would introduce the Savior to the world publicly. He would he would declare Jesus before repentant people. But he would also declare Jesus before self-righteous people, those, those Pharisees and scribes with their arms folded, looking down their nose at the events of John's baptisms. He would declare Jesus before secular rulers, as he did later than this when he was in Herod's jail. Herod would go down and talk to him. He was declaring Jesus before skeptical doubters who were in that crowd. But John had their attention. He had the attention of the crowds, and he would use that attention to point them to Christ. Then Jesus also says it was necessary to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was going to fulfill, conform, to that standard of the will of God. And he was going to conform to that 
like no one before him ever did or no one coming after him ever would. All righteousness, to fulfill it. But again, in New Testament theology, we can read into this, that Matthew is telling his readers that Jesus would fulfill all the re righteous requirements of the Father in order to be the Savior who we need. He didn't need to be baptized to demonstrate repentance from sin. He had never sinned. Now, this baptism, was a lot of things. But it was here that he was properly being introduced to the world as the Savior who would identify with the repentant sheep of Israel, even the lowliest of those sheep, and one who would accomplish salvation on their behalf because they, like us today, were fully unable to save themselves. So John's question at the beginning gives us insight into the promises past. This is who Jesus was. And Jesus' answer begins to explain the promise's purpose. So the basis for the promise is Jesus Christ, and the purpose for the promise is Jesus Christ, and finally, there's a third participant in this short dialogue, and that's God the Father, which brings us to our third point. Because in the Father's statement, he shows that the preeminence of the promise is Jesus Christ. The Father's declaration proclaims the promise's preeminence and that promise is finally on the scene. You know, the entire Trinity was present in these short verses. God the Son was there. We're going to see God the Holy Spirit came. And God the Father speaks. The first thing we see in verse 16 is Jesus is the anointed one of the Holy Spirit, what is anointed by the Holy Spirit. When, when he had been baptized, verse 16, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Well, I wonder if that was a dove. A lot of symbolism with the dove going way back to to Noah on the ark. Remember when he sent out the dove and finally a second or third trip came back with that little twig. Since then, the dove has been this symbol of peace. I don't know if it was a dove. Um, one of the accounts says it was a dove, but the other ones say like a dove. Maybe I've spent too much time in New York City to not want this to be a pigeon. Um, did you ever watch how they land? They're kind of majestic in how they land sometimes, unless they're running into a building. They, they kind of come down. There's, a lot, there's some noise with them when they're landing. And the noise is different than the vision. The noise is that of confusion and beating the wind. It draws your attention. But when they land, it's graceful. They're coming down slowly, almost like a helicopter. So I don't know if this was a dove or, or like a dove. In the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit descended as in flames or tongues of fire. But it's that flittering. So I don't know. But everybody there knew. Whatever they saw, they knew it was the Holy Spirit of God coming. And he came, verse 16. Isaiah 42 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. 
Jesus is anointed by the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus is established in the place of divine authority, verse 17. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. My beloved Son. The promise is revealed as Jesus embarks on his earthly ministry. And he embarks on that ministry with the full complement of his father's authority. I find it so interesting that at the end of the book of Matthew, he's going to repeat, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Here it was authority over the earth. When he is about to ascend to his father's right hand, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You know, an often quoted response to Jesus' preaching was that unlike the Pharisees, Jesus preached as one who has authority. And that authority came from the Father, and it was first announced right here at his baptism. I am well pleased with him. He's the preeminent one. Psalm 2, verse 7 says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Not that he gave him birth. No, Jesus always existed. The only begotten of the Father, as the Gospel of John says in his introduction to Jesus, full of grace and truth, only begotten. That doesn't mean the one of many born ones and he was first. No, it means the preeminent one. The Son of God. That was declared right here at his baptism. God's promise is his preeminent Son. Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior. Remember the fish symbol? Um, Thinking about that this morning, we actually broke bread. The bread we broke here in the auditorium was a fish. A little goldfish, right? Is that right? Should we do that? Whatever. But the early church communicated that they were a believer by carving this little one motion figure of a fish. Probably looked a lot like the the goldfish we have today. Why did they use that fish? Because the word fish is pronounced something like ichthus. It's a five-letter word in Greek. But if you take each letter, it's the first letter in the title, Jesus, Son of God, Savior, or literally, Jesus Christ, that was in there, God's Son, Savior. What's Matthew saying to his readers? He's saying to his readers, believers, living 30 years after the resurrection of Christ, maybe 30 more than 30 years. He's saying that they can be encouraged because Jesus truly is the fulfillment of God's promise to mankind. To us who believe, who are reading these words today, the Holy Spirit's saying the exact same thing. That we have put our faith in the only possible place and in the only possible one. who can forgive sins, and who can guarantee us a home in heaven. Now, if you're listening to this and you've never believed in Jesus, man, I would invite you to put your trust in him. Because literally, there's nowhere else we can go. If you know Christ, take Jesus' presentation as great encouragement that we've believed 
and the only one who can provide. Father, thank you so, so much for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for being kind. Father, as we move into the aspect of our service together where we break bread in remembering your son, in honoring him, help us to do it with the confidence of having believed in the one whom you presented to the world with John. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Bob, for that message. Um, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. That wasn't in the, the Matthew passage, but it was in uh, one of the other Gospels. Um, the fact that Jesus Christ uh, came to this world in the flesh, humbling himself in order to bring peace. Peace between sinful man and a holy and just God. And um, this morning as we kind of remember that incredible price that was paid to remove our sins, uh, we can just be thankful that there is peace between us and God. Um, and again, just we're, we're starting our, our communion service. If you have your, your bread or your juice, please make sure that that is uh, somewhere close by. Um, but as we look around the world today, as we look at the news today, we can see that there's not a lot of peace. There's not a lot of peace. And there's not a lot of solutions um, that are being presented. But yet, mankind's biggest issue in life, our sinfulness, our greed, our, our anger, our, I don't know, you could go down the list of the seven deadly sins or, or any others. The fact that we are rebels has been solved by the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we can be eternally grateful um, that that price was paid because Jesus took the, the weight and the penalty of sins on himself and paid them in full. Behold the Lamb of God, the perfect sinless sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world. Um, so together, let's just, let's just pray uh, for the bread uh, before we take the bread. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are once again truly grateful um, we are thankful for your mercy, for your love, for your grace, for your forgiveness, for that reconciliation that we can experience between us who are so sinful and between you who are so holy and righteous, Lord. And we thank you that you didn't um, make us do something that's so impossible, Lord, but you did the impossible by sending your son uh, to become the, the very payment for our sins, Lord. And we thank you for that atoning sacrifice. And we thank you that you became flesh, that you dwelt among us, you paid the price, and you rose again from the grave. Uh, so as we um, take this bread today, Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be overflowing with thankfulness. In your name we pray, amen. In the same way that we took the bread in honor and in memory of our Lord Jesus, whose body was broken for us, um, as has been the tradition of the church since this feast, or I almost don't call it a feast, since this was instituted um, even in the Last Supper, the church has been doing this ever since. So we've taken bread in honor of his body broken, and now we drink uh, the fruit of the vine in honor of his blood being spilled for us. So, Father, we're thankful for your son's life that was poured out for us. We're thankful that um, the bloodshed symbolizes a life that was given. Um, we know he did that voluntarily for us, and we praise you and we thank you for that. Um, Father, his life drained away, his earthly life, and, and he was dead for three days. Father, we praise you that, that he rose again from the dead. He not only rose from the dead with that new body, 
but but he walked among men. He was wit he was seen by men. And then, Father, he ascended to your right hand. But we know, Lord, we're told to do this until he comes. So we look forward to his return. And so we give you thanks for for just for this cup that was given, his life was given for us. In, G in Jesus' name, amen. See 